Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to a new gradient type that was introduced for iOS and iPad 18, as well as for Mac OS 15, and that's the new Mesh Gradient. So let me take you through some of the explorations of the new gradient and show you how you can create some pretty impressive backgrounds and some custom styles for your projects. I love getting your feedback, so if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment below. Make sure you ring the bell to enable notifications and get notified whenever a new video is released. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. A link is in the description. There is a starter project for this video and you can download it from the link in the description. There are two branches, so make sure you download the starter project branch. The completed branch contains the source code for the completed project for this video. You can just download and expand the zipped archive. At the time I recorded this video, I'm currently running Xcode Beta 3, but I'm still on macOS Sonoma on this computer. Now the project has a number of different tab views with very little content in each, but I'll explain how we're going to pass through this as we get to them. Omesh gradients are a new kind of gradient view introduced at WWDC 24, and they can be used in your iOS and macOS apps. And like any other gradient view, they are expandable views in that they will consume as much space as they're presented with. So before I create one, let's explore how the mesh gradient view is set up. So here is a view that is being presented that I want to fill with a mesh gradient. We'll be laying out a grid of vector points within this grid, and each of the points will have a color view associated with it. In order to determine the coordinates of the vector points, a mesh gradient defines it as follows. The top left is 0, 0, the top right at 1, 0, bottom left is 0, 1, and bottom right is 1, 0. Now, all of these coordinates are instances of a SIMD2 vector struct, where the scalar type is a float. Well, a mesh gradient is defined as a two-dimensional grid with a width and a height that determine the number of vector points we want to display in the view. For example, if the width were 3 and the height were 2, it would be a 12 vector point grid. Well, these can be positioned anywhere we want, but for simplicity's sake at the start, I'm going to evenly divide up my view and place my 12 vector points at the intersections of these divisions. And the first four are already in place at the corners, though they don't need to start there. Now on the top then, that point in the middle will be at 0 0.50. The next row will have the same x values as the first row, but the y values will be at 0.33, or one third of the way down. The third row has the same x values again, but the y values will be two thirds of the way down, or at 0.67. And for that remaining point at the bottom, the y value is the same, but x will be at 0.5. Well, when we create our grid, we build an array of these 12 vector points. Each point can have a color view and you can choose whatever color you like, but for demonstration purposes, I'm going to make them all different. And then I form an array of these colors where there is one-to-one -one correspondence between the vector point and the color based on the index of each array. So let's take these then and build our mesh gradient within code. Now there are five different initializers for mesh gradients, but all of them involve defining a width and a height along with an array of some kind of point and array of colors assigned to the corresponding point in that array. And the one that you're most likely to use is this first one that creates a new gradient mesh specified as a grid of colored points. So in our case, the width was three and the height was four. So I'm gonna transcribe those points as we just laid them out. And I find it easiest to do it this way by typing in the first row, and then I just copy and paste the subsequent rows, just replacing the corresponding scalar values as necessary. And then we can add our colors array as we had defined them. Now, as we add the colors, the mesh gradient is being displayed in the preview. 
So let's ignore the bottom edge to push the gradient view to the bottom. Well, as I said, we don't need to be strict on a grid. But if we want to cover a full view, we'll need to make sure that we have the points on the outside that will cover the entire view. But let me adjust some of the points here. For example, I can move that top middle one down to a vertical position of 0 0.5, but keep the horizontal position. And then on the second row, I'll take that middle point here and move it directly up to the top. Similarly, I can move the middle of the third row to 0 0.25 and 0 0.75, and the middle final to 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So let me make those adjustments then to our mesh gradient. And I'll keep the colors the same. We get a very different look indeed. In fact, the background is now visible. So we can add another property for the mesh gradient, and that is a background property that takes a color. So let's say green. But let's tone it down a bit by reducing the opacity. Another property we can add is smooth colors, which is a Boolean value. And you can see that by specifying true, nothing changes. So that means it's the default. If I change it to false, I get a different effect. And finally, though this is not part of a mesh gradient, because I'm displaying a background, I can add a shadow to our gradient to make it pop a little. So I'll add a shadow with a color of gray and a radius of 15. Now this isn't necessarily the best example of a mesh gradient, so in the next view we're going to explore some more. Now we're going to use this as a playground so that we can do a little experimentation. So assume that we're going to create a 3 by 3 mesh gradient that I might want to use for a background. This means that we'll need 9 points and 9 colors. So let's create an enum namespace that we can use for this view and subsequent views. So I'm going to call this enum app data. And since it's going to require an array of nine vector points, I want to create a static array of these SIMD2 scalar vectors. And we can do it like this. And then for the 3x3 three three array, that top row will be evenly spaced at 0, 0, 0 0.50, and 1.00. And then we can just copy and paste those rows two more times to get the 3x3 three three array. And I'll just change the y scalar vector to make sure that it's the same for each row. Now for the colors, I'm going to do something a little different. I want to be able to reuse some of the same colors, so I'm going to only create an array of five colors rather than nine. And I'll use that as a static array of colors. And the colors that I'm going to use are purple, cyan, mint, teal, and indigo. Now since we only have five and we need nine, I'm going to create a function that will generate nine random colors from that selection. So there will be some repeats. So we can start with a function definition that I'll call random colors that will return an array of color. And then I can use a closed range of 0 through 8 and map over that to generate an array. And that'll simply be one of our app data colors random elements but we'll have to force unwrap this. But this is a safe force unwrap, one of the rare occasions. So we can create our mesh gradient then. And the width will be three, the height will be three. And the points will be our app data points. And since I want to experiment with my colors, I'm going to create a state property called colors that is initialized by that app data random colors function. So now that I have this variable of colors, I can use that in my mesh gradient. 
And again, we can ignore the bottom edge. Well, now comes the fun part. I'm going to create a toolbar. And inside the toolbar, I'll create a button using a label that is a system image. And that image will be arrow.3.trianglepath. And I'll make it a little bit larger by creating it as a font with a title size. And then for the action, I'll simply update the colors using that app data's random colors function. Now, each time you tap the button, the mesh gradient changes. But if you find one that you like, you want to capture the colors. So I'm going to add a print statement to the action that'll simply print out a string describing the array of colors. So you can play around with the colors and even change some of the points to get a feel for what might be possible. So let's try adding some animation in our next example. So let's copy the mesh gradient from the previous example and replace the text view in the animation demo view. We'll also need that state property as well. But what we want to do is to change the manual tapping of the toolbar button with a timer that'll repeat that every three seconds. So I'm going to create a timer constant by calling the timer publish method every three seconds on main and in common and have it auto connect. We can now then use the publishers on receive method for the time, which will give us the time as an iterator, but we won't need that. But what we can do is within the closure, update the colors array by calling our app data's random colors function. And then to make it nice and smooth, we can do that using an animation block with an ease in out animation over three seconds. Now your mesh gradient is gracefully changing every three seconds. Well, you could get even more creative by randomly changing the points and just making sure that the X and Y values that you generate are between 0 and 1 and are floats. Now I'll leave that up to you, but here's an example of something that I was playing around with. It's kind of interesting. But I don't want to do that here. I want to use our original view, the animation demo view, as a background on another view and get a little bit more creative. Well, now that we have this nice animated background, we could, if we wanted to, use it as a background for this view by using a Z stack. So as the first element in the Z stack, I'm going to provide an instance of the animation demo view. As the second element in the Z stack, I'm going to create a text view displaying the string Xcode is fun. And I want to make it larger, so I'm going to use a font and set it to a system size of 100 with a heavy weight and a rounded design. And I'll center it by using the multi-line text alignment and set that to center. Now let's tone down that background by adding an opacity of 0.4. What I like to do though is to change the black foreground style to our mesh gradient. Well, the problem is though that our view is an animated view. It's not a gradient style or a style. It doesn't conform to style. The mesh gradient, however, does. So what we can simply do is to recreate it without the animation, like we did in the experimental view, only without the colors being a state property. So I'll just copy from there and use that here. And then just change the colors to be the app data random colors. Now let's get a little bit more creative. I'm going to embed this text view itself in a V stack. And then as the second item in the V stack, I'm going to create another animation demo view, which is that animated view, 
but I'm going to set the frame to be a height of 200. And then what I like to do is to apply a mask. And in the closure for that mask, I can create any view that I like. So it could be a text view. But how about an image using the system image of Apple logo? And then let's make it large by setting it to a system font size of 200. Now we have this nice Apple logo using the same mesh gradient, but now, unlike our text view above, it's changing colors with the animation. Well, that pretty much covers everything you need to know about mesh gradients. The key, though, is being able to design pleasing ones. And to help you out, I created an app for this, and you can find the link in the description. I actually made a short video about it as well. However, after making the video and releasing the Mac app, I realized that it requires installing macOS 15 or Sequoia. So I decided to make the app cross-platform so that you could actually download and run the app in Xcode 16 and still have Sonoma installed. And you can then run the iOS or iPad versions of the app in the simulator or if you've installed iOS 18 on one of your devices. I updated the Mac app as well so that you can define your own display dimensions. And this is purely for convenience because the mesh gradient is always in a grid from 0 through 1 both horizontally and vertically. For the iPad and iOS versions, I've also changed it so that you have the ability to pick the colors directly from the movable points. Remember, what the app does is allow you to make modifications and then you can get the code to add to your projects once you have a nice mesh gradient. Or you can simply save the image as a desktop background. The iOS and iPad app works exactly the same way. The only difference is that the saved image gets saved to your photo library. Well, so that's it for this video. So I hope you've learned something new that you can use in your projects going forward. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and leave me a comment below. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and enable notifications so that you're made aware of new videos that I release. And also you can download my free channel listing app so that you're able to search for and find content from any one of my over 300 Swift and SwiftUI related videos. Thanks for watching.